Hi everyone, Sarah here from Sarah Humphrey Embroidery, Do something a little bit different today. You can see I'm in a different place as well. I've also got a little cat with me here, a little pinky cat. She doesn't make an appearance very often, so we are a bit privileged today to have her along. Um, so welcome to my first chit chat video, as I said. Um, so I put a not a call out, but a suggestion on the community page that I was going to do this video, just asking you for your ideas about what we could talk about. So just some informal chats about things embroidery related and design related and all that sort of stuff, um, that not necessarily a formal video that requires lots of planning. So just to sit down in a little chat with me um, about some different topics you might be interested in. So there was lots of feedback for that. Thank you very much for everybody who did do that. Some of the topics we will cover and some we won't. And I'll talk about why we won't do those ones in a minute. So for my first chit chat session, I was going to talk a little bit about designing your own embroidery and why you might want to do that and how you do that in fact but I thought actually it would be a good idea to just tell you a little bit about myself and um, where I came from how I came to be doing this and what my skills actually are and how I come to be making YouTube videos in the first place. I want to talk about my skills because it was apparent from the comments that there's quite a high expectation of what my knowledge actually is and I'm very honoured that you think that I know about all those subjects but I'm afraid I'm not able to talk to you about machine embroidery, um, tatting, knitting, crochet, lace making, all of those wonderful, wonderful um, creative crafts. Um, my particular skill set is quite niche um, and it's really traditional English hand embroidery and I don't really go out of that realm very much. Um, I can do a few other things that I taught myself but I don't really claim to be expert in any of those. I'm not um, an art historian either or a conservationist and I know a lot of you are really interested in the art history side and the history of embroidery um, and I know a little bit that goes with the techniques that I know but I don't I don't know a lot about it. I'm not going to pretend I do and try and blab my way through a video either so we won't be covering those subjects I'm afraid. So we will be returning to the topic of designing your own embroideries because it is one that I'm really passionate about actually and I will be asking members for their contributions towards these chit chat sessions so anything you might want to discuss or any experiences you've had so do make sure that you're um, joined to our membership scheme if you um, want to get involved in future videos if you don't know what I'm talking about you can check this video up here that will tell you all about the memberships um, and how you can get involved in that. If you don't want to join, it's absolutely fine. The normal content of the videos won't change at all. You'll still still get the same content that we normally put up, so don't worry if you can't. But if you do want to join us, you will get some extras, um, including an invite to be um, to help me um, with future videos. If you are having trouble signing up, I should just mention this, by the way, um, some devices don't show the join button or the community page, so you have to do a little bit of a, a workaround. Um, so if you are having trouble seeing the join button, um, which should be here down by the subscribe button, then um, if you can't see that, then do check the description below this video. There's some technical information there on how you can still join in um, and join us on memberships. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about me. So um born in Coventry in the middle of England. Um got quite a creative family, I suppose. We all make something in some way, um knitting or clothes making or um embroidery or machine embroidery, um lots of skills in my family, so I suppose I was always going to do it um eventually, but I didn't start out in textiles or embroidery at all I had quite a different career beginning so I was an engineer and when I left school I went and did an engineering apprenticeship mechanical engineering and I went to work for a boiler manufacturer and I made central heating boilers um, and I cut my teeth that way I guess I did my apprenticeship I worked a year for them and then they actually uh, closed the factory in the end and made everybody redundant and I decided I wasn't going to wait for that. Um, I was at the beginning of my career, lots of time to go and learn something new, and I got the travelling bug, and I thought, I'm going to go off and see a bit of the world and take this opportunity to do something I may not have done otherwise. So I packed my bags, and I got on an old army truck, and with a load of other people as well, we set off around the world, and I did an eight-month tour, and we did 32 countries 
in eight months, so that was going at some. And I went all around Africa, um, down through the Democratic Republic of Congo, into Tanzania and Kenya, then we went up the other side to Egypt, we went across um, Asia, um, finishing in Nepal, in Kathmandu, and then I loved that so much I stayed there until my money ran out. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to get a flight home, which was a bit sad, but obviously nice to see my family again. But the point of me telling you that is that's really where my interest in textiles began and sewing. I did a little bit when I was a young a young girl, as, as you do at school. Um, but this is really where my interest was piqued by it, seeing all the beautiful things that they made in these countries, these beautiful embroideries in India and some uh, dyeing and weaving in Africa, a lot of indigo dyeing in Africa. And I kind of came home with this massive collection of, of textiles, which never really shown an interest in before. But I think seeing these artisans actually making them was really interesting to me. And I suddenly had this amazing collection of textiles that I brought back with me. So I guess it was only natural, really, that then I wanted to learn how to do it. So I did an online course back in the days when online stuff wasn't as popular as it is now, since the pandemic's made that much easier and a lot more available. And I did an open College of the Arts, which is like the art version of Open University, if you're in the UK and you know what that is. And I did a textile course with them. But I did find that quite a difficult way to learn. It was sort of saying, be experimental with this and have a play and have fun with that. And I didn't know what these things did in the first place. I sort of found I was missing some building blocks, if you like. Um, and I didn't know how to be creative with something that I didn't know how to use. So I decided after a few months of this that I needed some proper training. So I was like, where can I go? Who does the training who will actually teach me some stitches and how to use these threads and the RSN came up the Royal School of Needlework came up so I investigated that and I went for an interview there down to Hampton Court Palace in London and I had a good look around and I liked it and they liked me and to cut a long story short I got a place on the apprenticeship. Now they don't run the apprenticeship anymore but it was a three-year course um, full-time course in traditional hand embroidery techniques so you spent the first two years learning different kinds of embroideries we'll talk about that in a second and then the third year in the studio doing restoration and conservation and helping to run the shop and making the tea in the tea room um, anything that needed doing really just the business of embroidery a little wash get to sleep darling. And I so did that for three years and I had to move down to Hampton Court and I lived in a little flat, which was very nice. Actually, I did love my little flat and I did that full time and it was quite intense. So at some points of that in in the second year, we were doing more advanced levels of stitching and we did nine to five in the classrooms at Hampton Court and then we had to go home and do homework and I'm sure at the height of it I remember doing about all in all 70 hours of stitching a week which is intense and I don't recommend that to anybody by the way because it hurts your shoulders and your eyes and all sorts of other stuff but that's the kind of level that we were doing then and if you didn't finish a piece then you had a hand in date you had to get things done by certain dates and if you didn't hand it in you lost half your mark straight away from just not handing it in. So there was a lot of pressure to do it, but that was really good because later on in life when you, you work for yourself or you have clients or anything like that, you have to work to a deadline. So it really did teach you how to do that. You've got to make those decisions. When do I stop? I'm running out of time. I can't take it out and do it again. So I've got to stop there and actually really useful thing to learn how to do. So this is where I want to point out that the skills that I've learned and what I can actually do and talk about with reasonable confidence. Um, so we did the basic skills, some basic techniques in the first year focused around traditional English hand embroidery techniques. I mean, that's vague because a lot of those came from abroad and were inspired and came with the silk route. And that's very, very complex embroidery history to go with that. So when I say English, ones that they would have worked in England that you'd know as maybe English techniques. And we learnt things like crawl work was the first one we did. And we did Jacobean crawl work specifically. Do have a video about that if you want to know what crawl work is and what Jacobean is and what the difference is between the two. So do check that out. 
And then we did some silk shading, so some needle painting. We did canvas work, um, which you would know as needlepoint if you were in the US watching this. And black work we did, so another counted technique. Stump work, which is a three-dimensional embroidery, which we will have a look at as well. And gold work. So gold work is quite a, a big one at the school that you have to do. The Queen's coronation robe is covered in gold work and we kind of had to learn that technique so if there was ever another one <laughs> there'd be somebody to stitch it and we were really really lucky on my year on my apprenticeship for the five of us I think it was then to go to Kensington Palace um, and see the Queen Mother's coronation robe is the one we actually saw which is very very beautiful some beautiful elements on it that has and they got it out for us and they laid it out on the floor and we actually got to spend time looking at it and making some drawings from it and doing our own design from it which we then went away to work later. So my skills are based around those subjects. Now I have learned other things since that I have taught myself and I have expanded um, that knowledge as well because when you only stitch something once and you're learning a piece and we made finished pieces, we didn't do little samples, we, we made our first piece of black work was our finished piece of black work. So those are the skills that I have around those and I have done some work on those myself later just to advance a little bit and learn a little bit more and even doing these YouTube video teaches me a lot when somebody says oh yeah I've done that in this thread or have you seen that kind of embroidery and I, oh no I haven't I'll go and look it up so I am always learning but those are the things that I focus on and you will see that in my video so gold work especially we've done some silk shading and some black work as well so they're kind of all based around what I learned on the apprenticeship plus a few little extra things that I've learned along the way. So some of those extra things that I've learned, I do want to mention because I think um, you should always keep learning. I don't think you should learn one thing and stop and just do that endlessly for the rest of your life. And I like to add to my skills base. And I think if you're creative, you do like to learn new things because then you can add those into what you do. So when I was at the Royal School of Needlework doing my apprenticeship, I did an evening course in printmaking. And I went to my local college and I learned how to do printmaking and I've done a lot of drawing in my life and much more recently because I think drawing is essential if you want to do your own embroideries which we'll talk about in another chit chat um, drawing is quite important to know how to do that and to learn it and people go oh I can't draw I can't draw but it's not something you can or can't do it's something you learn just like you do any other skill so I've done quite a lot of drawing I've done some painting um, actually got one on the go I can show you Ooh, this is one I'm making at the minute just painting I'm doing for I'm gonna try and put it in an exhibition and see if they'll take it I don't know if they will so this is a jungle theme got quite a lot of jungle stuff going on at the minute so that one's part way through so I've got acrylic background and a watercolour bits on here turn it to the side these are cut out watercolor paintings and i stuck them on to give them a bit of three dimension so that's something i'm working on at the moment if you're interested in my art i do have an art instagram account so sarah humphrey art underscore between each one and you can follow me there and see what what i'm painting and what little things i'm messing about with as well so i've done quite a lot of drawing and painting that definitely comes into the embroidery you can do much more creative things with backgrounds um, and just get other ideas as well so that's definitely um, is having a contribution to my <laughs> embroidery skills as well do a little bit of crafting as well got some little books that I've made Look, oh, two books there little weird cut out things and if you've ever done my designing for embroidery class that I did at Hampton Court, you will have made some of these. We did these there. So just different ways to display your work and get creative. And I made a little box for them. And I've got a little... This is my sketchbook that I took to India. So I did lead a couple of textile tours around India, as a not as a tour guide. We had a very um, very expert guide, but um, two guides, in fact. Um, but I sort of made sure everyone was on the bus when they were supposed to be on the bus and that sort of thing. And I took a little sketchbook with me. It's two-sided. I love these little books, these Constantina books. So 
so you can just draw on one side of the paper Ooh, you can open it out and you've got a whole big bit to sketch on and this is my chip to India I did the root on the plate on the way painted the root and I can just sort of grab ideas it's nothing you know particularly beautiful it's a working thing really so just did some little sketches of things I saw that I liked along the way buildings people listed all the animals that we saw a great guy who got on the bus at one point um and just made a little sketchbook of it and then if I want some ideas I can go back to my sketchbooks and I can look through and think oh what inspired me what was I really taken with and you can always go back and look for other resources and photographs and on that subject on the internet you don't have to just work from this but it's just a little record of ideas as I go round um, my daily life or traveling or wherever really and I just made one just for India because I like making little sketchbooks basically so we do crafting as well. Um, what else do I do? A little bit felting. I like felting. I love needle felting. I love beadwork. Anything to do with beads. I probably look at the beads more than I stitch with the beads. But you might see those coming into my embroideries as well more and more because I just love to add some texture on with the beads. So all of those different things contribute to my embroidery practice. I may not use them directly, but even the printing, I now can print on fabric and know how to do that and print some background. So it's definitely worth keeping learning, learning other things. Um, and I just love doing it. I love learning a new skill. Um, so that can contribute to um, my embroidery. Okay, so how did I come to be talking to you now on YouTube? So when I finished my apprenticeship, um, we did a lot of teaching in the last year. That was something that surprised me. Never, ever planned in my life to be a teacher. And we did some in the third year of the apprenticeship. You would start to help out with classes. And then when you were confident enough, you could actually run your own class. And I really enjoyed it. I found that really, really enjoyable. Passing on the skills, meeting people. Very, very rewarding job, actually. And I thought, I'll do this a little bit more. So I got a teaching certificate when I was at the school. I did a two year evening course to get my teaching certificate. And then when I finished, I did lots of teaching for the RSN. Once you've learned how to stitch, doesn't mean you know how to teach it. <laughs> teaching is a whole new skill altogether. And I learned a lot, a huge amount. So I just taught and taught and taught um, as much as I could to get lots of experience. And I did probably about 10 years for the RSN, I think, teaching the certificate and the diploma courses, teaching day classes as well, and went to America and taught for them there. Um, interesting going to another country, there's different language to use, um, different cultures, um, everything is different. So that taught me a lot, going to America and teaching there, and um, very different to teaching here. Um, so that taught me loads and loads of skills. So quite surprised that I did like doing that, but I I'm glad I did because it's a great way to earn some money because it's quite hard to make money out of just selling your embroideries. Um, they take so long and people don't know the value of them. Maybe that's one for another video actually talk about that. Um, so teaching was a great way to earn some money. So I did that for a long time. I had other part-time jobs as well that I did to top up the bank account. <laughs> pay my bills um, you don't really go into this if you want to make loads of money it has to be said you do this because you love stitching and you love being creative so um, I did lots of other things at the same time I didn't live very near Hampton Court either I was living down in Kent in the southeast of England at the time and it was a good two hour drive when the traffic was bad to get to Hampton Court so I did need to do these other things as well and then I started to teach for myself in some different venues I moved around a bit as well and lived in quite a few different places in the country so as soon as I moved away from Hampton Court that wasn't so much an option I did help um, with another colleague to set up the rugby RSN school and I did that for three years as well so that was interesting to set up um, some classes there and do some more of the admin that you don't have to do when you're at Hampton Court because somebody else does that. So it was booking the venues and making sure we had all the equipment. So that taught me a massive amount, I think, which was enabled me to then um, do that on my own in my own studio. So I work alongside my husband now, Jonathan. So Jonathan does all the orders 
so he prints those off and packs those every day and um, he edits these videos as well so he'll be doing that in a bit when I finish talking and um, we work together we have a little studio in the in the back of the garden that we work from um, with the little busy cats that come and visit regularly and help us out and um, we do uh, so waters from the shop and the shop was a bit of an accident as well actually and um, never planned to have a shop either it's funny how life works itself out and I remember somebody asking me about prick and pounce kits specifically they was talking about this prick and pounce method and how you transfer the design and they go no where can I buy one of these kits and I was like well we can't really you I don't know and then I thought well I could make one make a little print and crowds kit easily enough and I made a little video to show people how to do it because I'd go in a class and we'd talk about it and then go I can't remember how to do it how do I do it and then rather than me emailing instructions I thought well I'll make a little video and you can go and see the video so I just did that on my table from the room I worked in I don't even know why I filmed it on now um probably not very good <laughs> I go back and look at it now but it was a great resource so yeah you can go and look at that prick and pounce um, video and see how to do prick and pound and that's kind of what started it really so I did some velvet boards as well that was another one where can I buy a velvet board for my gold wet you can't basically but we can now so we made some velvet boards and we sell those and the prick and pounce kits and the velvet boards are among the, the biggest selling items that we have really because they're unique to those techniques and it's not something that you can buy off the shelf so I did that on my own for a couple of years, actually. And then Jonathan came on board with me. I got really, really busy and he was in a position where he needed some work. And I said, why don't you come and help me? So he started to make prick and pounce kits and then he started to do the orders. And then we just got too big. We couldn't work from the house we were in. Um, the space did limit us, definitely. So we moved up to Nottinghamshire, which is where we are now. And we built the studio in the garden and we've got a space that we can work. Um, and really importantly, if you were ever thinking of of working for yourself or doing something like this yourself um, a door that you can shut and lock and walk away from at the end of the day because as much as I love it I do do it all day long and do I want to do it all evening as well and do I want to be surrounded by it no not really I have other things that I'm interested in outside embroidery so it's quite important to separate the two things out and have a job and a place to go to work and a place to leave at the end of the day and it doesn't quite work like that but as much as it's it's able to um we can lock the door and we can leave it and forget about it and then come back to it next day so it, that is quite important if you're ever thinking of doing this for yourself so when the pandemic hit um i was doing some teaching so i was teaching um some classes for the rsn i used to go down there and teach some drawing classes with my sister caroline so if you see my tamba videos you will um know who caroline is and we talked together design drawing and design for embroidery and then obviously the pandemic put paid to that and some of the classes that i had I did some private ones from home and i taught as well at the lincoln heritage skills center taught some embroidery there and all that ground to a halt but the shop did go quite mad so as everybody found themselves at home with some time on their hands not everybody lots of people and you all wanted to learn embroidery and a lot of people picking up embroidery for the first time so the shop went a little bit mad supplying people with lots of embroidery goodies to play with and then equally youtube as well where do you learn it when you're stuck at home so jump on youtube and find some videos so again not something you particularly planned on it just sort of happened that way and we were lucky thank goodness that we were in a business that thrived during the pandemic and um, I know many people haven't and it's absolutely tragic um, but it is great to see how much creativity came out of that time is that something good has come out of it and that you're all busy making so we tried really hard to make more video content because we knew more people were at home wanting to do it and watching and we managed to get out a video every week last year so 2022 now so 21 we got a video out every week and it was hard work <laughs> it was really really hard work um so we're doing one every two weeks this year and then hopefully you're going to slot something like this in between and try and build that back up again just while we recover a little bit from that experience so the shop keeps us super super busy youtube keeps us super super busy um and it's thanks to you for watching so i do want to say thank you for that and all your comments as well and interacting and getting to know quite a lot of you quite well <laughs> through youtube um i hope maybe you could meet 
somewhere, someday. Um, that would be really wonderful. Um, and if you do want to support the YouTube channel, the easiest way is just to make sure you give things a thumbs up if you like them. The little YouTube um, algorithm will pick that up, hopefully, and say, oh, this is popular. People like this. We'll show it to more people so they'll get to see it. And then hopefully that um, carries on and on. If you want to join the membership, that would actually be really, really great. Support us that way. But don't worry if you don't want to. It's fine. As I said before, the channel will stay the same and do subscribe to the channel as well that will give you a message when we upload something new if you click the little bell as well so you won't miss anything because we have got lots of really good content coming up including a terrific giveaway when we hit a hundred thousand subscribers which we're not far off as i speak so do keep an eye out for that and if you're subscribed you will get information when that has gone up as well so you really really don't want to miss that one so I hope you've enjoyed this little chit chat session. I've not rambled on too much and sent you all to sleep. I've sent the cat to sleep, so um obviously obviously not that not that interesting if your little pussy cat. She's gone to sleep in my jumper, so she's quite happy. If you do like this sort of thing, you think this has got some legs and you'd be interested to hear some more on some different topics, do give it a thumbs up. As I said, you can leave a comment below as well with some suggestions. Members will get a chance to join in for some future ones as well. So do let me know what you think um, and if you want me to do some more of these as well. Okay, so I think it's time for me to sign off. So have a great week, everybody. I'll see you in the next video and um, it's back to work for me. Bye.